let's say, I don't know, doing a bungee jump or a skydive or something like that. Perhaps there's something amazing that you want to see. I don't know, the Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon. Or, or maybe there's something that you want to achieve before you die. Complete some long-standing ambition. What's on your bucket list? What we have in 2 Peter chapter 1 that we're looking at uh, this morning is the Apostle Peter's bucket list. Now, Peter's done a fair bit in his life already. So when it comes to experiences, how about being filled with the Holy Spirit and then preaching so that 3,000 people come to put their trust in Jesus and are baptised? Peter could tick that one off the list. That's what happened on the, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. But when it comes to seeing something amazing, how about seeing Jesus in his glory, transfigured so that his clothes dazzled white? Tick. We heard uh, earlier in our first Bible reading, Peter was there when that happened. Which makes what was on Peter's bucket list seem slightly, well, unremarkable. On his bucket list, what Peter longed to do before he died was remind his readers of what he'd already told them. It's not very rock and roll, is it? But what we see in this section is the absolutely vital importance of what Peter had to remind not just his original readers, but us today. Please, if you haven't already, do turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. You'll find it on page 1,222. 1, 2, 2, do. 1,222. Now, Peter knows that he is going to die soon. Do we uh, see that? He speaks in verse 13 of living in this tent of the body. And then he says in verse 14, I know that I will soon put it aside, the tent of this body, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter knows that he's going to die, as of course we all do. But he knows that he's going to die soon. Jesus has made it clear to him that his death is imminent. This letter of 2 Peter is the last we hear from him. The great communicator Peter who features so much in the Gospels, who was really the undisputed leader of the church in Jerusalem, uh, from where the good news about Jesus went out. Uh, and now, some 30 or 35 years later, he knows that he himself is going to die, as many of his fellow apostles have already done. What's on Peter's bucket list? To remind his readers of what he's already told them. As the apostles, the crucial first generation of Christian leaders is about to die out, uh, those to whom God revealed the good news about Jesus, what Peter is desperate to do is not to tell these believers new things. He doesn't write in this letter, oh, here are a few things I forgot to tell you. You've got to know these. These are key. No, Peter what, isn't wanting to give them new insights or new revelations. He wants to remind them of what he's already told them. And he says, verse 12, that this is even though you know them and are fully established in the truth you now have. They already know these things. Why does Peter want to remind them? Well, verse 15, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Today, of course, is Remembrance Sunday, where rightly we remember and give thanks to God for those who gave their lives in defence of their country. It's right that we remember them. But as Peter is coming to the end of his life, his priority is not for his readers to remember him, but to remember what he has already taught them. What is it that he's taught them? Well, it's the gospel the good news about Jesus. And if that was Peter's priority for his original readers, I would suggest that his priority for us would be exactly the same. He wants us to remember the gospel. If you're uh, here as someone who's exploring the Christian faith, it might 
strike you as odd that this is what Peter wants above everything else. But for Peter, the message about Jesus uh, that he first made known to his readers and now wants to remind them of, this is more important than anything else that this world has to offer. And that's why Peter is desperate for us to remember it. So we've got two headings this morning. Here's the first. Remember and pay attention to the biblical gospel. We've seen Peter's uh, deep desire. Let's read it again in verse 15. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Now, we might be thinking that remember means just keeping some information in our heads, information that maybe isn't particularly useful. We might think of remember as being like revising for a school exam. You get a load of fairly useless information in your head that you can then regurgitate on an exam paper if you need to. But that is not what Peter means by remember. Remember for Peter is a very active thing. And actually, I want to suggest that's how we use the word remember as well. It's a very active thing that affects our lives. Uh, Last month, uh, I read this book. It's a brilliant book called Elizabeth is Missing. Has anyone other than my wife read this book? I know she has because she told me to read it. Anybody read this book? It's brilliant. It's written through the eyes of Maud. Now, Maud is an 82-year-old lady who suffers from dementia, which means that she can't remember things. Does that affect life? Of course it does. Her failure to remember affects the whole of her life. Maud can't really cope with living on her own anymore, so she moves in with her daughter, Helen. The trouble is, she keeps on failing to remember that she's done that. So she keeps on returning to her old house, and then her daughter has to come and pick her up and and brings her back to her house and says, you live here now, Mum, remember? But of course, Maud doesn't remember. That's why she keeps going back to her old house. Failing to remember massively affects how you live. Peter wants us to remember the gospel so that our lives are then shaped by the gospel. We saw last week in the first half of 2 Peter 1 that God's divine power, which comes as we trust the gospel, gives us everything that we need to live a godly life. But if we If we fail to remember the gospel taught by Peter and the other apostles, then we will not live a godly life. And ultimately, that can have eternal consequences. For it's those uh, who keep going in the Christian life, who will, verse 11, receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's why we must remember Peter wants us to remember and to do so with confidence. So verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Does the thought ever go through your mind, what if it's all made up? What if the whole Christian faith isn't true but was invented by people who came after the time of Jesus, seeking deliberately to mislead people, mislead people like you and me. Now, it seems that the original recipients of Peter's letter might have have been worrying along those lines, which is why Peter seeks to reassure them in verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories. That's not what was going on, as we told you, about the gospel of Jesus. No, instead, what he's taught them about the life uh, and teaching of Jesus it is what he and his fellow apostles have seen and heard for themselves. It's important that we know that. The Christian faith, the writings of the New Testament, it, it's not made up. It's not cleverly invented stories. No, it's the record of what the eyewitnesses see, saw and heard. So uh, Peter, we're virtually certain, uh, told what he had seen and heard uh, to Mark, John Mark, 
so that Mark could write it down. It's the second uh, of our Gospels in the Bible. Mark wrote down everything that happened on the basis of what Peter told him. And we heard in our first reading of that account of the transfiguration of Jesus from Mark's Gospel. That's what Peter's speaking of uh, in these verses 17 and 18. It says, He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We were there, says Peter. Peter, James and John, they were there. They saw what happened. They heard the voice from heaven with their own ears. This isn't something second-hand and garbled. No, this has come directly from an eyewitness. And my guess is that Peter chose this incident of all the extraordinary things that happened in the life of Jesus because in some ways it was the most dramatic of all. Jesus transfigured the voice from heaven. Peter and James and John were there. And the apostles' witness to Jesus didn't come out of the blue. It confirms and builds on the promises of the Old Testament. So verse 19, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The word of the prophets here isn't just referring to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and others that we might call prophets. The word of the prophets is shorthand for the whole of the Old Testament. The Old Testament points forward to Jesus. And what the Old Testament pointed to is made more certain in the testimony of the apostles. That's why Peter can say, we have the word of the prophets made more certain. If I can put it like this, Old Testament and what that has to say about Jesus, that on its own is certain. Old Testament equals certain. Old Testament plus New Testament equals even more certain. And verse 19, you will do well to pay attention to it. Peter says, then as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We're not going to spend much time on that. The day, I think, is pointing us forward to the day of Jesus' return. And although we're not going to dwell on that today, we'll look at it in much more detail when we come to chapter 3 of 2 Peter. But the key point here is, you will do well to pay attention to it. Friends, are you remembering the biblical gospel? Are you paying attention to what the Bible says? As Peter nears the end of his life, this is his great concern. I think there is a danger for those of us who consider ourselves church members that we fall into the trap of thinking, well, of course I remember the gospel, and of course I pay attention to the Bible, after all, I'm a member of a Bible-teaching church. We have a sermon from the Bible every Sunday. Of course I pay attention. If you're part of a house group, you may uh, think, well, we look at the Bible every week at house group. But remember who Peter is writing to. Those who know the biblical truths and are firmly established, and yet he wants to ensure that after he dies, they pay attention, that they remember the gospel and pay attention to the Bible. Now, for myself, I need to be reminded of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, every day. If I fail to remember the gospel, what I do is I slip into the way of thinking that my acceptance by God depends on what I do. And then one of two things happen. If I feel I'm doing pretty well, well, frankly, I get proud. And I think, oh, I'm, I'm doing really well. Good for me. Oh. But on the far more frequent occasions that I don't do very well, I just get depressed and think, oh, no. Uh, look, look how terrible I am. And I need to remember every day 
that my acceptance by God doesn't depend on what I do, it depends on what Jesus has done for me. And when I fail to remember what God has done for me in Jesus, what I do is I slip into a spiritual half-heartedness. We're told in the first part of chapter 1 of 2 Peter, we looked at it last week, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Now, when I forget the gospel, I don't make every effort. Frankly, I don't make much effort at all. So every day, I need to remember the gospel. And every day, I need to pay attention to what the Bible says. And I would suggest, so do you. Remember and pay attention to the biblical gospel. Secondly, understand that the Bible is God's word. Understand that the Bible is God's word. We're looking here at verse 20. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. It is something of a preacher's dream when trying to work out what a passage is about to have these words in a Bible passage. Above all, you must understand. Above all has the sense of this is of first importance. It's like Peter has circled what he's about to say with flashing neon lights, saying, this is the big thing. And what's he so desperate for us to understand? Well, let's see it. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Again, by prophecy of Scripture, Peter means everything that is written in the Bible. In chapter 3, he talks about the writing of the Apostle Paul being Scripture. And we've seen in verse 19 of our passage, he talks about the certainty that we can have uh, as the writings of the Old Testament are put together with those of the New. For the whole Bible, this is not just a human book. In human terms, there are over 40 different authors to the 66 books that make up the Bible. But no prophecy, that is no part of the Bible, had its origins in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is men speaking from God. In other words, though the Bible has human authors, Behind it all is a divine author, God. So for this letter that we're looking at to Peter, Peter is the human author uh, of this book of the Bible. But as he wrote, the Holy Spirit was at work so that this is not just Peter's word, it is God's word as well. And the phrase at the beginning of verse 21 is so significant. Prophecy never had its origins in the will of men. Why did the different books of the Bible come about? It wasn't in the wills of men. It was in the will of God. So 2 Peter ultimately was not written because Peter one day thought, I know what I want to do. I'm going to write a letter to encourage my Christian friends to keep remembering the gospel. No, this book and every book of the Bible had its origins in the will of God. God caused this book and every part of the Bible to be written. That, above all else, is what Peter wants us to understand. That the Bible is God's word, written because God wanted it to be. Friends, can I ask whether you have understood and grasped it? If you're here investigating the Christian faith, the way that you investigate the Christian faith is you investigate the Bible. How do we know what God is like? How do we know what he's done and how he wants to relate to us? Because in the Bible, men speak from God. And so God's way of speaking to us 
is through his word, the Bible. It's why the Bible is at the center of everything that we do here as a church. Now, if you're investigating the Christian faith, a great way to investigate it is through our Christianity Explored course that we'll be running in the new year. It'll either be a Wednesday evening or a Thursday evening. If you want to come and you have strong opinions on which you'd like it to be, tell me, and it might affect which day we do it on. But in Christianity Explored, what we do, what it's centred around, is Mark's Gospel, the account of Jesus' life that Peter related and Mark wrote down. And we do it not just because it's an eyewitness account of Jesus' life, which it is, but because God speaks through his word, the Bible. So let me encourage you, why not come along in the new year and, and join us for Christianity Explored. And if you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, then we must grasp that the Bible is God's word. A and again, if we understand that, it's not just a bit of information in our brains, it affects our lives. I wonder if you can imagine uh, saying to someone, look, I love you, but I'm not really that interested in what you have to say. It'd be an extraordinary thing to say, wouldn't it? I love you, I'm not really that interested in what you have to say, though. The person who was told that would, I think, conclude that actually you didn't love them. A and your words saying that you loved them, well, really, they were just hot air. Maybe you just wanted something from them. Can we see, if we say to God that we love him, but then have no real interest in hearing what he has to say through reading the Bible, then it's a horrible thing to say, but maybe our words that we love him are just hot air. Peter wants us to understand that the Bible is God's word so that we're eager to read it and understand it and live it out. Now, is that a description of you? Are you eager to read and understand and live out God's word? It's very easy in the Christian life to have a theology that says that the Bible is very important, but a day-to-day -day practice that suggests that really it isn't that important at all to us. And if you can slightly recognize yourself in that, Maybe you need to let your understanding shape your action and your practice. Remember and pay attention to the biblical gospel. Understand that the Bible is God's word. That's Peter's bucket list to remind us of these things. I wonder whether some of us need to repent of being casual about God's word. And I would suggest that all of us need to resolve afresh that we will remember and pay attention to what God says in the Bible, knowing that it is his word. And that doesn't start next month when life may feel a bit calmer. It doesn't start next week when you've got through the things on your to-do list. If we're serious about hearing God in his word, this starts today doesn't it? Reading the Bible, being serious about the Bible. It's got to start today. If you need uh, help in that, well, ask someone. Uh, ask me or Tom or, or someone you trust. Help me. I, I don't know how to read the Bible. Please help me. But friends, I want to suggest that where there's a will, there's a way. Do you want to read the Bible, God's Word? Because if you want to, well, you will do it. Let's ask for God's help, shall we? Dear Lord God, we thank you for your kindness to us, that you do speak to us that we may be certain. We pray that we would be those who do long uh, to remember uh, the biblical gospel, to pay attention to what your word says, to live out what you teach. Thank you for your word. We pray that we may treasure it as we should. And we pray that we may be those whose lives are shaped 
by all that you say to us in your living word. And we ask for the sake of our Lord Jesus.